little bit about our architecture. You've heard a little bit about the fact that we have a shop floor viewer web browser, as you can see in the top left, that is a thin client browser. So essentially what happens is when you engineer your process, you publish. When you publish, you publish to the shop floor viewer server, which is a whole separate server that um, could be cloud-based and you could do on-prem for your authoring of your process. You could publish to a cloud server. Uh, it doesn't have to be a cloud server, but the bottom line is it is a server, I have a server that all of the client shop floor viewer interaction is in a thin client environment, which means you're on a web browser. So our entire shop floor MES system is a web-based tool, okay? Thin client web-based tool. Not true for our authoring environment, but definitely true for our shop floor viewer environment. And so the web browser is essentially what you see. We test on, um, obviously, Chrome. Or uh, we have some Intel Nooks you'll see here in a moment, those little small Intel PCs. But we also test on Raspberry Pis uh, in the uh, Raspbian environment with the Chrome browser on that. They work great. So those are our web browsers. Now also we have another server that's running FactForge, which is our Andon system. Okay, so um, and the Andon system FactForge is essentially a system that reports the status of the shop floor like any Andon system would. It can receive it receives transactions from shop floor viewer, just like it would receive transactions from any device in the world. In other words, our FactForward and on system completely receives what are called JSON transactions. These are essentially little text snippets of information. So there's nothing special about shop floor viewer telling our and on system something happened. You could have your Excel spreadsheet in your office tell FactForward something happened. You could program your CNC machine tool, tell something happened. You could have something in your car blow up and tell Backboard, something happened, right? It doesn't, Backboard doesn't care where it gets the information. It gets it wherever you want it to get it from. So Backboard is a separate system, but of course it's used a lot with our shop floor viewer because when things happen on the shop floor viewer and the S side, we want to tell Backboard so the world gets to know about it. But it also is a big client web-based system. And of course then, as you'll see later, our PFAP application, which is our handheld Android scanner type apps, tablets, apps, and things like that, which are used for shop floor they also have a system that uh, is client-based. We also have something called the ProPlanner IoT service. Now, you'll notice there's some little dashed lines around there. The ProPlanner IoT service is an actual software program that runs on your subnet in your factory. That's only needed when you're talking to shop floor automation on that subnet in that factory, okay? So it is a piece of software that runs on a computer somewhere on the network or the industrial automation that we are talking to work. So we talk to that app in a secure way. That app can talk to anything on the subnet any way we're allowed to, which the bottom line means 99.99% of the time is in a non-secure way, but that's okay. Uh, it's up to you how you want that to happen. But that is another tool that we have that's installed architecturally. Of course, what is it we're talking to? Well, it could be ELCs, it could be um, light towers, um, and on light towers, it could be DC torque tools, it could be whatever. And we have a whole bunch of stuff here. We're showing you how that works. So that's what's going on. You can see on the bottom, the data center. Uh, so that those are actually the servers that are talking to the apps on the top left, which are web-based apps and our IoT service in the top right, okay? So the hard work is done in the bottom left by the server technology that's on your, let's say, um, your, in your network or on Azure. The top left is what you see and the factory network on the top right. So um, that's essentially the control system, these databases, and we have these secure web service APIs that are talking to Shop of Viewer, PFET, and um, the um, API, uh, Internet of Things device. Now, let's talk a little bit about specifically devices. And I'm drilling down talking about just industrial Internet of Things. So how do we do this? Well, on the left, you have assembly planner. That's process offering. On the right, of course, shop floor viewer, which is our NES environment for which the DC Park tools are communicating. What I uh, want to say is, you know, the question is, why should Pro Planner be talking to my tools? Like, what's the whole business value proposition of this? Here's the deal. When we're dealing with NES systems in assembly, they're human-centric. This isn't an automated testing. This is a human who gets information, but also uses tools that are smart. This is a very different MES problem than one we had 10 years ago, one we had 20 years ago. One of the things we are doing then in ProPlanner is we're saying, when this operator torques this bolt, I want it to use this PSET, this program in the DC torque tool. I want to use a PSET 7. 
But if it's this model with this option, I want to use a PSET 6. Or if it's this model with this option, I want to use this tool, this nut runner, with a PSET 42. Okay? So what we're doing is we're telling the automation, the scanner, the DC torque tool, the PLC, we're in charge of understanding the model option rules. That's part of the process plan. That's part of the bill of process, okay? We know, the bill of process knows what instructions to deliver that operator, the human, for which model and option they're working on at this particular moment in time, right? That's the knowledge in the process that we publish to the shop for work instruction. All we're doing now is publishing the same information to the tools. So I tell the robot, okay, I want you to do this particular program at this particular moment. Don't care why, we take care of that. We tell the robot to. We don't have to build all the model option configuration rules in the robot's logic, only to then when the process engineer changes them, remember, oh, darn, I have to go back out and reprogram the robot. You don't have to do it. All you got to do is make sure that the DC torque tools have all the different torque profiles that we may ever use in them. We'll decide when we want to use them. We need to tell the scanners and the torque tools um, or the other tools like the PLC what to do. We decide when to execute. And more importantly, if I have four stations of torque tools all set up in different parts of the plant and I move a task from one station to another, automation engineer doesn't have to do anything. As long as that PSET 12 is in the other torque tool as well, as long as the nut runner that we need is available to that operator, we publish the work instruction and bam, that torque event now happens in station 12 instead of station six. No automation engineer had to go out and reprogram six and reprogram station 12 and test and validate and run. We can literally go from eight in the morning on one line balance with one set of automation profiles to 10 in the morning with a different set of automation profiles. Now, obviously, if a physical nut runner needs to be moved or something like that, that's going to happen. And we have a report for that. So we generate a report saying, hey, this nut runner needs to be changed. Automation engineer can make that change. But the automation, the software logic, the rules are all automated and simplified. So we, in Assembly Planner, then, our resource library, you've been using resources, you call them tools, is getting smarter. So now a tool also knows that it's an automated tool, which means that the shop floor viewer needs to notify a piece of equipment on the floor. And so we add that logic into the resources, we give it the values, the, the knowledge, the PSET 7, if it's a DC torque tool or whatever PLC program knowledge it's needed, is added to the attributes, the properties of the resource in assembly plan and published to the shop floor viewer, okay? All the shop floor viewer does is say, oh, do this activity, do this work step. For this model option, I need to send this information to this tool, and that's what it does. And you're gonna see us do that here in just a moment. So that's how that works, uh, a little bit on the authoring. And so just real quickly, what I have here is a view of the, uh, of the resource. So I haven't defined a torque tool. I've set up that this torque tool is called a ST1 DC Torque 6N. And whenever I drag that into my work step, because work steps talk to tools. So that's the only thing, uh, training class, but we, an activity needs to have a work step if it's gonna talk to a tool. And we drag that intelligent resource from the resource library into that work step. And I've now activated those properties of that tool to that work step. So when the shop floor viewer sees that work step, it knows, oh, send this information to this address, to this tool, to make sure that we're communicating correctly. So that's the knowledge you build into the resources. And then this is the mapping. So here's where I'm in my activity. Here's my work step. I go into my tooling and I've drug in those properties. Anybody who's ever done test types in work steps, very similar concept. In fact, we're extending the test type concept essentially to do DC virtual integration. 